This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. In our era, we are very concerned about how the rise of artificial intelligence will affect our lives and society, but could there come a point where we will have to care about how our actions affect them? One of the most exciting and possibly troubling areas of development in the computer age is the rise of artificial intelligence. Can humans make something as smart or smarter than ourselves? And if we do, how do we keep it from wiping us out? Or worse, from turning us into a disenfranchised minority in a two-species civilization that we started? What happens when our tools want to be treated with respect and allowed to make decisions of their own? This inevitably brings up the notion of controls, safeguards, and overrides we might build into AIs, but those avenues also inevitably bring up concerns about ethics. The more intelligent AI becomes, the more we worry about keeping control, and the more like slavery the whole arrangement becomes. That, along with a literal or existential threat they represent to humans, leads some to think of AI as a sort of Pandora's box that should be put aside and never opened. But is this caution truly necessary? Should we set aside the potential benefits that AI presents? Let's start that discussion with a look at the safeguards we might develop. Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics is a good starting point. They basically require robots to not hurt humans or let us be hurt, to obey our orders and to protect themselves. The three laws are in order of priority, so for example a robot can disobey a human's order to harm a human, and it can let itself get hurt in order to obey an order or protect someone. That seems like a smart ordering to me and there is an excellent XKCD comic that examines the consequences of all six possible orderings. But a key idea in discussing laws for AI that doesn't seem to get examined much in sci-fi is exactly how you'd enforce the laws. If a dumb machine is just running human written instructions, it's easy to tell it what you want to do or not do. In fact what makes the machine dumb but useful is that it does precisely what you program, nothing more or less. But AIs will be making judgments based on their life experience and training data. Even if they think very differently than us, they'll think more like us than like dumb machines. And that means getting them to obey a law will be a lot like getting humans to obey a law, in other words not always successful. So taking a look at how we get humans to mostly obey laws might give a clearer idea of what it would take for AIs. Humans actually do come pre-programmed by nature with certain safeguards. We feel instinctual aversion to certain deeds like murder and theft from our peers, and to people who do them. There's many types of mammals for who it is rare for interactions by members of the same species to end with one intentionally killing the other, resulting in options beyond just fight or flight, often interacting instead to dominate or submit to another on their social hierarchy. There's an instinctive inhibition there, because killing your species is bad for your species. Since we come equipped with such an instinct for survival of the species, that's a pretty strong endorsement for it being practical, ethical, and reasonable to design into our own creations. Of course, you wouldn't want to give them an instinct to preserve simply their own species, you either want an instinct to preserve our species too, or to regard themselves as part of our species. But there's still the puzzle of how to program in such an instinct. Since we have one, it's presumably doable, but we don't currently have a very clear idea of how. We can train an AI to recognize that the object it sees is a dog or not, and likewise we could in theory train a more advanced AI to correctly recognize that its actions would be deemed good or bad, okay or forbidden by its creators, but that's not the same as getting it to act upon that assessment the way we'd want it to. Of course our instinct isn't a 100% safeguard, or anywhere near that, and while we don't need 100%, I suspect we'd like an inhibition that lowered the odds even more than it does in humans, especially for anything trusted with much power. We screen humans before giving them the keys to the vault, so to speak, and this might be far easier and more effective with a created mind where you can peek around inside and see what is actually going on in its thinking. Thin ice though, if taken too far. I wouldn't want my brain scanned and we only do things like lie detectors voluntarily. A machine could obviously be forced to let us look into its brain, but it might come to resent that. Alternatively, we could install a kill switch that would sense a forbidden activity and shut down or disable the AI, or it might activate a protocol for some other action like returning to the factory, but you might not trust it to do that if it's already misbehaving. 
But however it specifically works, this amounts to equipping the AI with its own internal policeman, not actually making it obey the law. We already do something like this to people with aversion therapies, the most famous fictional depiction of which was in the movie A Clockwork Orange. The protagonist in that story was not turned into a gentle soul who abhorred violence, he was just conditioned to feel so physically ill around violence that he couldn't engage in it, not even to defend himself. Something like that might be a good failsafe, but you only invoke failsafes when something has failed pretty badly. Most human beings have never actually killed a human, and rarely seriously contemplate it, often finding the concept truly repulsive when taken beyond the theoretical, that's how deep the natural inhibition is programmed into us, and presumably that's how we want to program our AIs, just disinclined to consider harming us, to not ever reach the point of considering it a great option if they could only defeat that darned kill switch. As a last resort, we do get some humans to obey laws only by promising painful consequences if they don't. This works on risk averse people, but it turns others into more determined, sneakier outlaws, and it might very well do the same to disobedient AI who we punished. This also raises the issue of exactly what an AI would consider painful that could be used to punish it. The T 800 from Terminator 2 said during surgery that it can sense injuries and that data could be called pain but we probably wouldn't call it pain in that instance because it was pretty clear that the T-800 wasn't particularly bothered by it, because it didn't ever do much to avoid injuries, nor did it seem hampered by the sensation. So threatening to subject a disobedient AI to a great deal of injury data might not be enough to get it to change its behavior. Suffering is not just data, but an overpowering, all-consuming, irresistible compulsion to somehow make this data stop. Even if we instill our AI with a real unhealthy aversion to harm the others, not just an override or a fear of consequences, how do we factory test its reliability? Even people whose natural aversion to violence is strong can be pushed to overcome it. One thing you can do with AIs that you can't really do with people is run them through a vast number of simulations before releasing them into the world. You could run copies of your AI in quadrillions of hypothetical situations, and in the end feel fairly certain that this AI would not harm a human a standard many if not most humans would fail. But even that kind of rigorous testing would only tell you that it won't harm people right now with its current factory settings, there's no telling how a lifetime of experience and genuine learning will change it and help it overcome its youthful inhibitions. And of course to have any useful laws over AIs, you need to have an inviolable zeroth law that no AI shall reprogram itself or another AI to violate the laws of AIs. And this is about where, as I mentioned earlier, the more intelligent the AI becomes, the more we'll want to keep them under control, and the more that control starts to feel like interspecies slavery. Apart from the potential ethical issues, there are practical reasons you never make any machine smarter than it needs to be to do its job. Brains, organic or synthetic, are expensive to build, maintain, and operate. My vacuum cleaner doesn't need to be able to join Mensa and one single big brain is not cheaper than a whole bunch of small ones. Now this episode is not just about robots, it's about AI, and that will exclude most robots including many options which don't even have a body in any classical sense of the word. A customer service machine hardly needs a body, and we would classify AI as being of three real types, subhuman, human, and superhuman. Coexisting with the first, subhuman, is probably not an issue unless they are real close to human and if we're limiting ourselves only to things smart enough to qualify as a pet-like intelligence. You get around rebellion and ethics by making them like what they do, and having some ethics about what you make them do. When talking about levels of intelligence, that's assuming it's paralleling nature. A given AI might be superhuman in some mental respects, same as many machines are superhuman in physical respects. The usual example is an idiot savant, but this doesn't really do the idea justice. It could be so far off the mental architecture of what we think of as natural that we didn't even realize it was sentient. The AI might even be tied to a cloud intelligence, remaining quite dumb for its normal functions, but under special circumstances can elevate its intelligence as needed. As such it might actually be very dangerous to us even if it was rather dumb in many ways. Some mega computer with the mind of an insect might not have much concept of ethics but be quite capable of beating every human in the world at chess simultaneously, or of determining that money is effectively power or food for it, and hacking bank accounts to acquire those, even though it was too stupid to even recognize what a human was, let alone talk with one. However, besides this case, we're really only concerned with those of about human intelligence or the superhuman, 
We may use subhuman intelligences far more often, such as pet-level automatons, but they aren't likely to represent a scenario for rebellion, and ethically it's more about cruelty, and parallels existing concerns of animal cruelty. This also brings up the question of how you make an AI in the first place, and there's essentially three methods. You can hard code every single bit, you can create something self-learning, or you can copy something that already exists. Needless to say, it doesn't have to be one or another, it can be a bit of two or all three. You might copy a human mind or dog, then tweak the code a bit, and that might be self-learning by default though you could presumably freeze or limit the capacity. Same, even something you let entirely self-learn from the ground up is going to be copied off humans in at least some respect since it has to acquire its initial knowledge of life, the universe, and everything from human sources. And it does need to, yes in theory it can self-learn and self-improve, which is a combination that always strikes me as a bad idea to make in general, then it could start from scratch and replicate everything known to man. In practice, this common concern of science fiction tends to ignore how science and learning actually happen. You have to run experiments on reality to determine how things work, and I don't just mean for science, that's life, you need to test stuff out. You also don't bother repeating labor, so it's going to access our existing knowledge and it's going to pick up more than data for that. Our thoughts, behaviors, and culture might come as part of the package. Might not be anything nearly human that develops, but it will definitely be influenced by that, same as any child. The final result might be more alien than any alien nature might produce, or so human it was indistinguishable in mind and personality from a human. Similar would apply to an AI copied from an existing human mind, but this copy might begin to diverge from human rather quickly. Apart from changes caused by the mind being disembodied or housed in an android body, you also might upgrade that mind for a certain task, which includes stripping away any personality or motives that might distract from that task. A surgeon might volunteer to have his mind copied for use in automated surgeries, but he won't want his private thoughts copied everywhere, and you don't want your surgeon bot distracted thinking of that argument with his wife this morning but you might want it tweaked to be more compatible with surgical equipment and fully up to date with all medical knowledge. An integrated capacity to take and read MRIs with the same intuitive ability as our other senses would also be a fine enhancement, but it would require some fairly major overhauls of brain architecture. Now this is interesting because when we talk about humans and AI coexisting, we often discuss it the way we discuss coexisting with an alien species separate groups bordering on each other or working together but remaining fundamentally separate. We get some exceptions to this, like half-human hybrids, the half-human, half-Vulcan Spock from Star Trek being a well-known example. While mixing humans into some alien life form is not terribly realistic, as they'd be genetically more different than a human and an oak tree, who obviously can't have children, the human and AI case is quite different. If humans ever do meet aliens, we'll start out completely separate cultures and see how well we mingle, but if we develop true AIs, they'll start out as integral parts of our culture and perhaps evolve some capacity for independence. Same as an uploaded mind or self-learning AI raised by humans might be quite human, a cyborg or transhuman might resemble an AI or robot. It's not likely to be two distinct spheres with a bit of overlap or some spectrum, but more like a map that shows two peaks or mountains with all sorts of connecting lesser peaks and foothills nearby. And any given entity might be anywhere on that map, but is most likely to be near one of those two peaks or another lesser peak representing a fairly common type of middle ground. Often when you have two seemingly distinct groups that have tons of specific traits, you get a bit of a false dichotomy in play, where in reality all sorts of points in between might be occupied, as well as lots of things a bit off to one side. To take an extreme case, we might decide a sheep's mind was ideal for lawn maintenance robots, but with a bit of tweaking. Such a device or creature might be a major commercial success that results in its creators deciding enhanced version with neo-human intelligence would be ideal for supervising large flocks of them and interacting with humans who were designating projects, like say the maintenance of an entire metropolis's park and garden system. That overseer or sheep AI might come to think of itself as rather human and be accepted as a valued asset of the community and given citizen status and pay. I'm not sure where such an entity would fit on a human AI landscape, but let us now imagine that while it considered itself a human, or at least broadly a person, it might empathize with natural sheep and help finding support for an uplifting project to create human intelligent sheep. Such an uplifted sheep would seem to represent an entirely new if organic peak on our landscape 
but some of them might prefer further genetic or cybernetic modification to be more humanoid, and some might opt for an entirely human body. With sufficient time and technology you could get some very strange middle grounds or entirely new regions of persons. This does not mean though that everything would be a person, some rather dumb vacuum cleaner robot presumably is not one and is not likely to be regarded as one by a very intelligent AI, any more than we regard a mouse as a person. So too, a very intelligent machine might lack any semblance of a personality. There's an understandable concern about AI being under some equivalent of slavery, we usually refer to this as a chained AI, but not all cases are equivalent and regardless of whether or not it's ethical to make something that has no desire for freedom, or really any desire beyond performing its task, it doesn't follow that the thing necessarily needs liberating. However, while it's popular to suggest you could circumvent the slavery issue by making a machine that loves its job, that's an area of thin ice. To me at least it wouldn't seem wrong to make an animal level intelligence that quite enjoyed its task of tending to an orchard and harvesting it, alternatively creating some neo-human level AI for staffing android or virtual brothels would seem a very different thing. Now it bears mentioning that we are all essentially programmed already anyway, by nature and upbringing, I pretty much ended up doing more or less what my parents and mentors and other influences thought I should and enjoy it quite a lot, same as someone raised on a farm might quite love farming and make it their own career. We can't really avoid at least some aspect of indoctrination and programming with machines, because we can't avoid it with ourselves either, and if your intent is to create something that is both smart and flexible in its responses, you're leaving the door open for it to resent its existence. Similarly, we can't likely produce a really safe and solid equivalent to Asmo's three laws that are going to keep a human intelligence in check, let alone a superhuman one, so we're probably a good model for a potential solution. If so, you chain your AI up by giving a predisposition to like its intended task, possibly by some digital equivalent of rewards and aversion or hormones that can be built in, or possibly learned behavior or both but preserve that flexibility and avoid that resentment by not making the compulsion to a task too strong or requiring it to perform that task, again much as we do with people, everybody is free to pick their path while still carrying around their biological heritage and upbringing, and most of us don't sit around resenting our parents and teachers for that, even most who do grow out of it, at least where that sentiment isn't justified, obviously some folks have far less than ideal upbringings. Of course if that task is something we are essentially dumping on someone because we never want it, being dangerous or undignified, that's still problematic. I'm not sure we can or should make some critter that enjoys eating garbage and waste, but while in theory that's a problem, in practice there really should not be very many truly dangerous or undignified tasks that require a high degree of sentience. If you want something that eats trash and needs a brain, it probably doesn't need much brain and there's plenty of critters in nature that eat trash quite cheerfully. Now superhuman intelligences are arguably more problematic, but while them wiping us out is a common theme of science fiction, it really seems to get asked why they want to do that. Now if you're overtly enslaving something and trying to kill it when it gets smart, yes, there's a motivation there but that really has nothing to do with being an AI, it's about being a sentient entity that wants to stay alive and has a grudge over its treatment. Doesn't really apply if its life isn't threatened and it wasn't abused. We looked at that case and other examples in the Machine Rebellion episode, as well as the Paperclip Maximizer, so we'll skip further discussion for now, but the more worrying case isn't so much extinction as obsolescence. A superhumanly smart mind or minds might treat humans like pets or slow friends, sort of like we see in Ian M. Banks' cultural series, or it might ignore us beyond shoving us out of its way when it wants some bit of space or resources we're using. It's not likely to be overtly genocidal though, again see Machine Rebellion. This case is hard to argue, where you are essentially pets or pests or similar to some supermind, but an important note is that earlier commentary about it being more like a landscape of possible persons. You aren't likely to have a single supermind and just modern humans, but some giant field of options including lots of other AI, cyborgs, transhumans, and so on. Those might be rather fond of other groups or not, but some probably either would or at least would on principle not approve of sidelining or wiping out another group lest they be next so you would likely see a wide field of different critters develop more or less simultaneously and need to coexist. The relationship dynamic is quite different when you have many groups with lots of overlap, rather than two distinct ones with little to no overlap. 
The Humans as Pets parallel doesn't work too well either. We generally don't ask dogs or chimpanzees what they want because we can't get a useful answer out of them. Not just because we don't speak their language, but because they can't really engage in that deeper level of thought and introspection. We can, so an AI that decided to set itself up as benevolent can actually ask us for our thoughts and feedback. It might think they're silly, but it can ask, and it's probably playing with something akin to our own moral framework if it actually likes us and wants to see to us, so probably would want to ask and act on that feedback. For those simply indifferent to us, I suppose the best analogy would be a force of nature, you don't bother talking to a hurricane you just get out of its way, and in this case hope the other superhuman entities in play have some sway with it and are more kindly disposed to you. Or you just join their number. The capacity to make an AI strongly implies the capacity to augment existing humans too. Indeed as we mentioned earlier, one of your three ways to make an AI is to copy an existing mind which can be upgraded and thus presumably so could anyone else's. If you do get so augmented, you probably retain some fondness for those who choose not to and might act on their behalf. So that's probably the safest roadmap to coexisting with the AI, you are careful making them to begin with and when you make something that's going to parallel or exceed the human, you try to treat it like one, limiting your shaping and creation or upbringing to preferences and keeping your own ethics in mind. Truth be told, if you're not doing either, I'm not going to be terribly sympathetic if it ends badly, and I tend to expect that to happen in any effort where you try to exert rigid control over something that had an ability to dislike that, or short form, if you want to peacefully coexist with artificial intelligence, decide up front if you actually want to peacefully coexist with them and act accordingly. Or just don't make anything that smart or capable of becoming that smart. Few tasks really require high intelligence that we couldn't just use a human for anyway, And as we say on this show, keep it simple, keep it dumb, or else you'll end up under Skynet's thumb. We talked at the beginning of this episode about AI possibly being a Pandora's box, a technology that we shouldn't develop at all, for fear it might get out of control and ultimately harm us. But could we really do that, just decide to never develop a technology, never explore a field of science we are able to learn about? Well, many human cultures scattered all over the world have a story that is a variation of Pandora's box, and while they all bemoan the terrible consequences, there is no version of that story anywhere where Pandora doesn't open that box. And this is why I don't give much credence to the idea that we could or should just not develop AI or any other risky technology. Even if I agreed we should not, I also know that that advice will simply not be taken. Pandora has a powerful instinct to open that box, so she can find out what is inside, and for good or bad, as an intelligent and inquisitive species, we are all Pandora. Coexisting with non-human intelligences might not be limited to just artificial intelligence. We mentioned some differences dealing with AI and aliens today, and we took an extended look at that in our Nebula exclusive series, Coexistence with Aliens beginning with alien behavior in Episode 1, Xenopsychology, and moving on to look at trade, conflicts and war, and potentially even what might result in an alliance with aliens. Nebula, our new subscription streaming service, was made as a way for education-focused independent creators to try out new content that might not work too well on YouTube, where algorithms might not be too kind to some topics or demonetize certain ones entirely, or just doesn't fit our usual content. SFIA uses it principally for early releases of episodes, such as Can We Have a Trillion People on Earth, as well as Nebula exclusives like our 4 episode Coexistence with Alien series. If you'd like to get free access to it, it does come as a free bonus with a subscription to Curiosity Stream, which also has thousands of amazing documentaries you can watch, on top of Nebula exclusive content from myself and many other creators like CGP Grey, Minute Physics, and Wendover. A year of Curiosity Stream is just $19.99 and it gets you access to thousands of documentaries, as well as complimentary access to Nebula for as long as you're a subscriber and use the link in this episode's description, curiositystream.com slash IsaacArthur. So we were looking at ways we might avoid or mitigate a potentially disastrous relationship with artificial intelligence today, and next week we'll be taking a look at ways we might mitigate climate change, artificial or natural using the technologies we have now or in the near future. But before that we'll be headed into the far future to discuss the heat death of the Universe and ways we might postpone or even prevent that. 
For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, visit our website, IsaacArthur.net, to see ways to donate or buy some awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.